Amen and hallelujah. Where would we be without God's grace? So brothers and sisters, I have the, the privilege of reading to you some verses from Matthew 22 this morning. We're reading to you verses, uh, verses 1 through 14, which you can find on page 979 in our pew Bibles. And I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's Word. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged, and he sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those who I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told his attendants, tie him up, hand and foot and throw them outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may be seated. Amen. So as you know, uh, we're blessed today to have Garrett Helbert and uh, his family with us, and uh, Garrett will be uh, sharing the word. He's a church planter. You know about the Manchester Project. He's a church planter in Manchester, Connecticut. Been in New England, been in Connecticut seven weeks, and that we said seven weeks. And um, so we're blessed to have him here. Uh, he's also a graduate of Nets Seminary um, training in Vermont that uh, you've heard us talk about that trains uh, pastors, local, uh, chain, tr trains uh, seminary graduated pastors for additional training to serve in churches in New England, to plant churches, to revitalize churches. So he's going to be planting a church in Manchester. So we're thrilled. And so I said last week, Garrett, um, in the time that I've been here, this will probably be the fifth time somebody other than myself or John or somebody from within the church stood behind this pulpit. So we're really guarded about that. So considering this is the fifth time, and one was last week, four was last week, five is this week, we're really blessed and to have you here this morning. So we'll go over here. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Sound all right? Yeah. It is such a joy to be with you all. I am so grateful to be partnering with you guys for the advancement of the gospel in New England. Um, when I moved here seven weeks ago, as John said, I had no idea that you guys would come alongside us and support what we're doing in Manchester. So I am, I'm, I'm just honored to join in what God is doing in Connecticut and to grab a hold of the rope with you guys and just be a team player in advancing the gospel seeing people saved for the glory of God and for their good Amen. here in this area. So I'm, thank you for having me this morning. 1677, John Bunyan 
a famous Puritan pastor, authored from prison a well-known book called Pilgrim's Progress. Maybe you've heard of it. It's one of the most printed and purchased books in all of history. The book is an allegory, or parable if you would, with characters and settings that are intended to reflect what it's like to become a Christian. What the experience of a Christian is like and what it's like to enter, the, enter into heaven with God. That means the characters have names like Christian or hopeful. They have names like talkative or ignorance. All of which reflect their identity in this world. And there's places like the city of destruction where citizens need to flee from it lest they be destroyed. And there's the celestial city which reflects heaven. So as the story goes, the characters are called out of their various cities by the king of the celestial city to come, journey, and be a part of his kingdom. The main character, Christian, has a great burden on his back, and it's more than he can bear. He is told that he must begin his journey by entering the narrow gate, which begins his salvation journey. Shortly after, he comes to the place of deliverance as he beholds a cross the text reads, his burden loosed from his shoulders and fell off his back. It tumbled and continued to do so down the hill till it came to the mouth of an empty tomb where it fell inside and was seen no more. And so the rest of the allegory goes. It's a beautiful parable of a believer being invited, being invited by the king, enduring difficulties, meeting unhelpful and deceived people at times, and finally entering the kingdom of heaven. But Bunyan's not the only one that's told a parable about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus often used allegories and parables to describe what the kingdom of heaven is like, and that's true of our passage today, the one John just read a moment ago. This parable, however, is about a king who invites guests to a wedding feast put on for his son. And this too is full of drama, having good characters and bad characters, plot twists and moments that, as we will see, reveal our hearts and experience in life. It's a story given by Jesus that calls us to identify who we are in the story. And most parables are meant for us to ask this question of ourselves. Am I the character on the right side of the story? That is, am I believing and living as one who will enter the kingdom of heaven? So with that question before us all, I'd like to enter into the parable of the wedding feast. Look with me at chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. It says here, And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king, who gave a wedding feast for his son and his servants, and he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. I think it's helpful for us to see here the context, the culture, and the characters of the parable. The context of this parable is the rising conflict between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. We're in Matthew chapter 22. Everything's been culminating to these final chapters. The polarity is existing between Jesus and the leaders of Israel. It's at a maximum. And only a few chapters later, the Jewish leaders are going to condemn and crucify Jesus. And in these final chapters, there is a clear theme of Jesus condemning the Jewish leaders and really the disobedient nation of Israel as a whole. And so this parable of the wedding feast is the third of three parables in a row that Jesus uses to rebuke Jewish leaders and Israel. Now it's also helpful to understand the culture behind this parable. We don't live in a land with a king, and I doubt many of you have been invited to a royal wedding lately. So this is a little foreign to us. This parable assumes a kingdom form of government. In a kingdom, the king is in charge and everyone in the kingdom is under his direct authority. 
And that's important to know because of the invitation that's going to be sent out soon. This invitation isn't like your office work party where the manager invites everyone Friday after five to hang out and celebrate that we got a big project done. Those invites you can easily reject, but not an invite from the king. We need to be picturing a medieval kingdom where when the king speaks, the people do. If you're a child in the room, think of Tangled or Frozen. When there is a birth, a coronation, or a marriage, the people of the king are invited to celebrate, and it was both a privilege and an obligation to come. You see, in most cultures throughout histories, they have seen themselves as people of the king, and they know that as it goes for the king, so it goes for the kingdom. So as the people of the kingdom, you want it to go well for the king. You want to see the family thrive. The king embodied the stability, the peace and strength of the kingdom. Belonging to a kingdom is both an obligation and a privilege. And here we have a king inviting certain people to be his special guests. So when you look at verse 3 and you see the word invited, we should be thinking in terms of summoning. It's not a take it or leave it kind of thing. The king summons special people to be a part of the royal party for his son. And this party or wedding feast is a little different than the weddings in our day. If you're lucky today, you can leave your house, watch the wedding procession, hear a sermon, homily, and the vows, cheer for the newlyweds, and be back in your armchair in less than 90 minutes. But not back then. Back then, these wedding feasts were very elaborate, with multiple meals and celebrating. These wedding, wedding parties could go on for days. They were a time of honoring the newlyweds, catching up with friends and family you haven't seen in a while, and just having a lot, a lot of fun. Suffice it to say, you would need to dedicate a good amount of time and your week to be a part of a feast like this, which could be the issue for some of the guests we will learn about in a moment. Context, culture, now who do the characters represent? Most commentators and pastors agree that the king represents God, the son being honored is Jesus, the wedding feast is the joyous eternal life in heaven, the servants are God's messengers, especially the prophets of the Old Testament, and the guests are the people of Israel. Remember, this parable was told over and against Israel. And so the parable is a picture of our Creator and King inviting or summoning Israel to join in on the celebration that honors His beloved Son, Jesus the Messiah. But verse 3 tells us that the people of Israel do not come at the beckoning of the prophets. So how does the story unfold between God, the King, and Israel? Look with me at verses 4 through 7. And again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated him shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Now the first thing we notice in these verses is the incredible kindness of the king. Not only has he invited guests to join in on this celebration, but at their initial rejection, he graciously sends out other servants to bid them come and enjoy the wedding feast of his son. And notice what the king instructs his servants to say to the guests. See, I have prepared my dinner. My, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything's ready. Now come to the wedding feast. There's no showing up and having to wait for your food. Everything is ready for the party to start. And in this second calling of the guests, I want you guys to clearly see just how gracious the king is. Imagine you've put together a party 
whether it be a birthday party, baby shower, work party, or wedding reception. The tables are set. The decorations are in place. The food's actually finished on time. And you look up, and no one's showed up. So you start to text people. You start to call people. But everyone has, a, has an excuse for not coming. What would you do? I know what I would do. I'd say, that's it. Party over. I'm not doing this. But that's not what our king does. He sends more servants to those invited. He graciously invites people of his kingdom again. And he gives them more chances. But how do the people respond to the kind and humble reminders of the king? Verse 5 and 6 tell us the guests were either apathetic, they have apathy and are busy with the cares of this world or the desire for other things. They have projects at home, things to do on the farm, business is busy, and they don't have time for an elaborate wedding feast. Or they respond with anger and opposition. They had it up to here with the demands of the king, and they want his servants dead. If you've read through your Old Testament, you won't see many prophets on the most like list. No one's winning that award as a messenger of the king. Many of them suffered shame and persecution from their own people, sawn in two. And the final prophet before the coming of the king was John the Baptist. And if you remember, his head was served on the platter to King Herod's wife. The king's faithful servants, of whom this world is not worthy, were ignored and injured by those whom God had chosen for this special celebration. So how does the king respond to guests such as these? Verse 7, the king in his anger commands his armies to destroy those murderers, to burn the place to the ground, that there may not be one stone left upon another. These guests have rejected the king and killed his servants. So the king renders judgment on the people. Now it's helpful to know exactly what this is referring to. I think that part of this parable could be referring to the numerous times God punished Israel. Do you remember the wilderness? He destroyed the whole first generation. Or how about the Philistines in the days of the judges? It could be the exile Israel endured at the hands of the army of Babylon. However, I think we should not forget just how severe the judgment on Israel and Jerusalem was in AD 70. Is that a date that you're familiar with? The ransacking and absolute destruction of Jerusalem and the temple? The city was burned. The temple was completely destroyed, as Jesus predicts in Matthew 24, with not one stone being left upon another. And I can't even stomach what the people did to their children as they starved during the several month siege of the city. And to this day, God has kept the nation of Israel from building a physical temple in Jerusalem. Israel, as a nation, has not experienced a more severe judgment than they did on A.D. 70, with its effects still experienced now. I think that's what's in view in verse 7. But notice that after the destruction of the disobedient guests, the king doesn't call off the feast. No, this feast is for the good of the kingdom. We want the son of the king to have his bride and to continue the prosperity of the kingdom, the peace and safety it provides. The king keeps the celebration alive by sending out the invitation to anyone and everyone. Look at verses 8 through 10. Then he said to the servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited are not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And so those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. 
The show must go on. Now the king opens the wedding feast to everyone. The king says to go into the main roads. Go to the places where the most people are. And I love this. Invite as many as you find. This is indiscriminate and exhaustive in scope. No criteria. No special status in society required. Anyone and everyone is invited to the wedding feast. And the servants do what they are told. Verse 10 tells us that the servants showed up with a bunch of people with them. Both bad and good. Can you imagine what this would look like? To see all these folks being invited in and filling the wedding hall? People from every background and race. People of all ages and stages of life. What a beautiful scene of peasants and princes sitting together. Blue collar and white collar sharing a table. Both bad and good. Saint and sinner. Haves and have-nots. Those likely to respond and those not likely to respond. This wedding hall is filled with philanthropists and felons. Patrons of society and prostitutes. The king wanted them all. And he got them all. The wedding hall is filled with guests. Now, who exactly are these guests referring to? If the first was Israel, who are these? These new invitees are the lowly outcasts. They're the untouchables in Jesus' day. Israelite fishermen, tax collectors, lepers, immoral men and women, particularly Gentiles, those of other nations. Similar to what Jesus said to the Jewish leaders in the first of these three parables, chapter 21, 31. Truly I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom before you do. So Israel, at a corporate level, is out, and everyone else is in. Now with Israel's judgment and the Gentile inclusion, is there any expectations from the king? The Jews were punished for their disobedience. Can all these new guests get away with whatever they want? Read with me our final verses. Verse 11. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So we see a wedding hall full to the brim. But just before the celebration is to begin, the king and his servants make sure everything's in place. But then they no notice something that's deplorably out of place. A guest without a wedding garment. Now to us in the 21st century, that sounds strange. Why would someone notice what another person is wearing? So allow me to address what the wedding garment is referring to and why lacking it is so deserving of eternal, heartbreaking, judgment. The wedding garment is a metaphor for righteousness. And there are two aspects to this righteousness. There is the imputed, the gifted righteousness that we receive when we put our faith in Christ. Paul says in Galatians 3.27, for all of you who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. His righteousness is like a garment that covers and surrounds us. And the other aspect of our righteousness is our practical righteousness. It's the righteous and holy conduct that proceeds from our faith. One particular translation helps us to see this idea in Ephesians 4.24, where Paul describes that we have put off our old ways of sin and deceitful desires, and we've been made able by the renewal of the Spirit to clothe ourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Just as you can tell a lot about a person by what they wear, 
so our deeds of love and righteousness are like a garment around us that show the fruit of our faith. Now this righteousness as a garment is seen further in a passage I think that Matthew 22 is ultimately pointing toward. Revelation 19. I'm sure you've heard this passage before. After the great judgment of Babylon, there is a marriage supper for the Lamb. The Lamb who was slain. Listen to the cry in heaven. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roaring of many waters, and like the sound of many peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give Him the glory. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It has been granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the linen, the fine linen, is the righteous deeds of the saints. Notice in that joyous depiction of Christ in the church, you see both God's grace and our righteousness. It was granted to her to be clothed in these things, and that the clothing is the righteous deeds of them. So with that understood, we can now see what's happening in the parable to the man with no wedding on him. This man has tried to enter the joyous celebration of heaven apart from Christ and without Christ-like living. He's tried to enter heaven by the wide and easy way and has hoped that his profession of faith will be enough and that he doesn't have to actually have the fruit of faith to get in. This man has ignorantly thought that because the king has sent the invitation to everyone, that his standards are no longer in place. If it's for everyone, then I can do whatever I want. But this man is dead wrong. The king calls him out for his ignorant presumption, and he's speechless. Instant recognition of his foolish choice and his just puzzle. Just punishment. The man is cast out of the kingdom into a place referred to as outer darkness, filled with those weeping uncontrollably and grinding their teeth away in agony. Clearly a picture of eternal conscious torment in hell. But I want to make sure that we see just how ignorant and sinful this person's choice was and why it deserves so great a punishment. I'd like to illustrate this by telling you about a unique wedding I once heard about. One time I was preaching at a church up in Maine, and this wonderful couple invited me to stay the night at their place so that I could uh, not have to get up so early and drive all the way to their church on Sunday morning. When I entered their house, they had all kinds of pictures around the house. And there was a few photos that particularly got my attention. Their daughter had gotten married in a dark red wedding dress. And so I had to ask. I've only ever seen someone get married in a white dress. So what happened here? Well, this couple proceeded to tell me that their daughter was a history buff. And apparently white garments did not become the standard until the late 1800s after Queen Victoria popularized the color amongst the upper class in England. And so their daughter went with a more traditional color of dark red. And to highlight this even further, this color of her dress, the groom and the bride required everyone to wear specific colors. The men had to wear black and the women had to wear white, whether they were in the wedding party or they were the guests. That was the will of the bride and the groom, so that her garment would stand out in it all. And I must admit, it was very artistic and beautiful amidst the crowd of white dresses. Now imagine with me for just a moment that scenario. Imagine if one of the guests had disregarded the will of the bride and the groom and showed up in a dark red dress. How selfish do you have to be to disregard the will of the bride and the groom? How ignorant 
do you have to be to show up after knowing exactly what you do, what you have to do to come? Can you imagine how angry those soon newlyweds would be? Completely disregarding what they asked of them. What couple would not exclude them from the wedding celebration? What person wouldn't be absolutely angry with you completely disregarding what you've been told to do? And yet it's no different with our king in the wedding feast. Servant after servant. Prophet after prophet. And every faithful pastor since has declared that there is no salvation outside of Christ. And that we must bear the fruit in keeping with repentance. The same message has gone out over and over again. And yet there are still those who ignorantly think they will have a place at the king's table. How foolish we sinners can be. Which is why Jesus is warning people through this parable. Which is why he ends the way he does. Many have been called, but few are chosen. Few will experience the banquet of heaven. Our kind king has been inviting continually, but few will rightly come to the wedding feast. In a single story, Jesus accomplishes so much. He captures the heart of the king, depicts rebellious Jews and sinners. He illustrates why so few actually belong in the kingdom or belong to the kingdom of God in our day. And he helps us to see that the king really is inviting all to come and be with him. That's the parable of the wedding feast. Now that we've understood the parable, how do you and I live in life? I think Jesus is telling us not to follow the majority, but to respond rightly to his call upon our lives. And secondly, to join his servants in calling all to come unto him. And I just want to prepare you for the next 20 minutes, I'd like to drill down on those two things. Responding rightly and joining the call to give the message to all. First, that we would respond rightly. In this parable, Jesus describes four ways people respond to the kingdom invite. Did you notice all four in there? In verse 5, we see that many respond with apathy. These are those who hear the summoning of the king, and they don't come with repentance and faith. They have a mad attitude. Mad. That's good for you, but that's not for me. They're apathetic. I've got other things that I'm concerned with. Things on my farm, business things, work projects, family life, hobbies to get better at, or fill in the blank for the care of this world most relevant to them. These people are apathetic because they do not truly see the cost of rejecting this invitation. They have more important things to give their life towards. In verse 6, we see that many respond with opposition. These are those who hear the summoning of the king, and it angers them. Maybe they have a belief system that it's running up against. Some have constructed a picture of what God is like, like the Jews. And they think, this is not what he's like. He would have come differently. He would have treated us differently. Or maybe the spirit of our day. If God is this demanding, I want nothing to do with him. It's the person who cannot stand that God, that God would call them to live according to his standards, his ethics, not theirs. Often it's in the realm of sexual ethics or control over their plans and future. These are those who, upon hearing what the king requires from his guests, oppose him and they take it out on his gospel messengers, whether it be verbal attacks or physical violence. In verse 11, we see the third group. These are those who are ignorant and insolent. 
They will gladly show up to what the king invites them to. In fact, they may even be eager for the king's wedding. They're excited for Jesus to come back. But it's on their terms. They come without a wedding garment. They don't think the king has any expectations of his guests. They ignore the call of the Bible to believe and follow Christ in righteousness. They presume upon his grace. And there's the fourth response. What's the fourth one? These are those who accept the invitation in a manner worthy of so great an invitation. They hear the gracious offer of the king and they come in faith and dressed in the righteousness that Christ has empowered his people to walk in. So I ask you, which one are you? Apathy? Would that describe you? If this was an allegory, would your name be apathy in the story? Opposition? Ignorance? Or acceptance? If you're here today, you would admit that you're one of the first three. I need you to see that none of those responses put you on the right side of the story. You're not in the right. I plead with you to throw off your apathy, throw off your opposition, your ignorance, and respond rightly to the king's invitation. He calls out for all to come to him in faith. So I tell you, please come. Respond to the king's invitation this morning lest you face the verdict of verse 13 and be cast into our darkness, A place where people will perpetually weep. A place where you will grieve unending with regret and you will have pain so severe that in the clenching and grinding of your jaw, your teeth will wear down. Come to the one who says it doesn't have to be this way for you. He's calling you, friend. Whatever you think of yourself, the text says both bad and good were invited. Whatever you think of yourself, whatever you've done, do you not fall in one of those two categories? He's inviting you. He has a place at his table for you. For you, dear friend, come to Christ today. What about those who are believers here today? Those who responded with acceptance. I want to give you two challenges under the idea of responding right. As a believer, my assumption is that all of us plan on showing up, right? We all want to go to the wedding but I want to make sure that none of us are questioned by the king. That none of us are surprised and speechless that we are not accepted. So first, this passage challenges us not to be presumptuous about our salvation. The man in verse 11 thought he was in. He made it all the way to the king, only to be rejected. Earlier, I overviewed Pilgrim's Progress for you guys. And the way the book ends is quite fitting for those who are accused of this third response. As Christian and his companion, Hopeful, near the celestial city, they run into a man named <coughs> Ignorance. A man named Ignorance. He is without the certificate of assurance because he has not entered through the narrow gate, but found a deceitful, crooked lane to get on the path just before the celestial city. And Christian confronts him. He says, you don't have a certificate. You didn't come in the right way. Please turn around and go the right way so that you can be received. He pleads with ignorance to come to the king in the right way, but ignorance thinks he's going to get in like all good people do. He ignores completely. All of the wisdom of Christian and hopeful. Fast forward to the final scene of Pilgrim's Progress. 
Christian and Hopeful have one last difficulty to face, the river of death. With much struggle, they make it through, and on the other side, they're able to approach the gate of the holy city. Upon arriving, each of the pilgrims give their certificate of assurance, and they're invited into the city. And they get to be with the king. It's no doubt the climax of the book. But interestingly, the last few paragraphs of the book aren't about Christian and hopeful. They're about ignorance. In ignorance also crossed the river of death just shortly after Christian and hopeful. He ascends the hill and comes to the gate just like them. But no one opens it for him. The men at the gate ask him, where's your certificate? And the book reads as this, ignorance had no answer, not even a word. And in the final sentences, two angels come and bind him hand and foot and take him away, much like the man with no wedding on in our parable. Can you just imagine with me for a moment? making it all the way to the gate, only to be denied entrance. Oh, brothers and sisters, we must examine ourselves, lest there be any presumption in us. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 13 to examine ourselves, to see whether we are in the faith. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, practice love and righteousness, you will never fall away. Now we know that salvation is all of grace. But we also know from James chapter 2 that faith without works is death. So the challenge is for us to not be presumptuous. Now, I'm not trying to make the tender and faith question God's love for them. Our enemy likes to sow that in our minds already. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to make sure that we are clear that we belong to the King. A sermon on this passage, void of asking you to examine your heart, your faith, and your walk, would be very unloving. You and I should want every professing believer we know to be welcomed at the feast and that none of us would be rejected by the king. Can you imagine sitting at the wedding feast and people you know at your table being called out by the king saying, how did you get in here? How grievous that moment will be for us. The people we've lived life with. The people we've attended Sunday morning services with. Sitting at our table. And the king says, what are you doing here? Would you not do everything within your power before him to make sure that that does not happen to those whom you know and love? So I ask you to examine yourself. It's painful, I know. When I was 19, I examined myself upon the preaching of the word, and it was clear that I had never actually began to walk in faith and righteousness. I was a college student and recognized that I was not belonging to the king. And though it was painful, praise God, because now I'm here today as one who's ex who has truly experienced the love of God and a life transformed, able to live pleasing to him. May all of us be far from presumption. The second challenge of this passage is to not let our love grow cold. This one isn't as easily, easily noticeable on the surface. But I want to ask you, what is a believer sliding back into apathy and opposition? Anything but letting your love for the king grow cold. So this passage is challenging us to fuel our love for the king, lest we fade and drift into apathy or even opposition. Our relationship with God has the same key principles that other relationships have. Some of you guys are married here. You don't simply have a great marriage. 
You have to work at it, right? You don't simply have great relationships with your friends. You have to pursue them and foster that connection and bond. It's not easy to have relationships. If you're like me, then from time to time, it feels like you're distant from the Lord. Your gut's probably right if you're feeling that way. Yes, it's shameful to make us, to, for us to feel that way, but the worst thing we can do upon feeling that distance from the Lord is to do nothing about that drifting in apathy. In our relationship with God, we want to be like the spouse or friend who notices the fracture in the relationship and says, I'm not letting the sun go down on this. I'm going to make sure the issue is faced. I'm going to bring it to God that I've been apathetic. I've been opposing Him. Maybe today the Lord is revealing to you this drifting in your heart. Have you felt numb and apathetic lately? Have you been struggling with the call to live your whole life for Him? And resentment and maybe opposition is starting to rise to the surface. Come to the King today. Acknowledge your sin struggles before Him. He's not going to reject you. Even if it's for the thousandth time you've come to confess your apathy. Remember, He's calling everyone to Him. Remember, our Savior died for us while we were still yet sinners. He didn't wait for us to be good. He expects us to come for the thousandth time that we've been apathetic. Come to the King. How dare we think so little of our King's heart for us? I'd ask you to use this hour and today to spend some time repenting. Let out your struggles before Him, acknowledging and asking him to pull the life support from your apathy and opposition. To fuel your faith, love, and obedience for Him. Our King is kind. I hope you see that from the passage today. And lastly, we want to respond rightly. Not only do we want to respond rightly, but we want to join His servants in calling all to Him. We want to join the call to all. How do we do that? What does that look like? To put it simply, we as believers take the initiative to engage anyone with the view of inviting them to know Christ. We take the initiative, right? Because everyone's going about their business, they're on their farms, they're doing their thing, not living for God. We take the initiative to enter into their lives, interrupt them if we have to, to invite them. We take the initiative just as God took the initiative in our lives. We weren't pursuing God. He interrupted us. He took, the initiative. he took the initiative with us. And we initiate conversations with anyone. And anyone means anyone. Everyone. We don't discriminate based on age, wage, or racial status. Anyone and everyone is invited. And so we extend the invitation of the gospel. That Jesus saves sinners. Now, if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard that you need to be sharing the gospel, right? Every sermon has that as an application. I, I, I need to share the gospel. And that's true. It's a good application. But it's not always easy to make disciples of all nations. So how does this passage help us to have what it takes? First, it's going to take us knowing the heart of the king who calls on. For us to be faithful servants, we must truly understand the heart of the king. We have to be absolutely convinced that our God wants his wedding hall to be filled with anyone and everyone. That his heart is for sinners of every kind. There is no one outside of the categories of bad and good. He wants everyone in, as many as we can find. Can you imagine what the church could be if we really got this? If we really understood that Jesus wants everyone? We'd look at everyone with a new set of eyes. Everyone as a potential guest 
in the wedding feast, family and friend, outsider and outcast. In the here and now, you and I would have Christian relationships with all kinds of people. Our social group would be very peculiar. It would be like the land of misfit toys in the best of ways. We would be hanging out with people from different ages and races, different socioeconomic statuses. I have so much room to grow in this area. But one of my close friends is in his 50s. He's on disability. He's obese and can barely walk. He smokes like a chimney and has a different standard of hygiene than I do. And yet God has knit our hearts together. God has made us friends in the faith. Sometimes I have to clean my clothes immediately after hanging out with him because when I hug him, I now smell like smoke. I don't like smoke. Smoking's fine, but I don't like it. That's what happens when I hang out with my friend. God has brought us together. I don't mind smelling like that sometimes because it's a testimony of God's grace that the king has invited me and him in. I want to ask you, have you ever had a moment like that where you recognize that the king really is inviting everyone in? Do you guys remember Acts chapter 10 when Peter finally got it? Peter sees that vision, right, of the garment coming down, the cloth, and it has what on it? Gentile meat. He doesn't understand what God's doing in his life. He gets a Gentile calling him Cornelius, saying, come, come down to Joppa, I believe. And he says, what am I doing here? And Cornelius says, God has sent you to tell us something. So I've gathered everyone to hear what you have to say, Peter. Do you remember what Peter says in response to Cornelius? He says in verse 34 of chapter 10, I open my mouth, and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. Do you hear what Peter's saying? Anyone can be acceptable. Who knows how long it took the Apostle Peter to get this. This dude was with Jesus for three years and didn't get it. He's the apostle of the apostles with the Jerusalem church and all the way in, all the way up until chapter 10 hasn't got it yet. But then he gets it. God wants his wedding feast full of people of every kind, both bad and good. Peter finally gets it. God wants them all. Do you get it? Do you understand the heart of the king who wants all to come unto him? If you're going to join in the call for all, you've got to know the heart of the king. Or you will start saying no for people and you will not engage people. Secondly, you need to have a heart that can take rejection. If you're going to join this call, you've got to have a heart that can take rejection. Just as our gracious God kept extending himself in our parable, we have to extend ourselves, even in the face of rejection. We shouldn't expect people to respond to us well. That's not what we see in this parable. How many people respond poorly? Three out of four. We should expect apathy when we engage people. We should expect opposition. We, we should expect to have to navigate, just like Christian and Pilgrim's Progress, the ignorances of this world. These are the people we will see. We should expect it, and not even for a moment let it cause us to pull back. Now, yes, we prefer when God brings us a person like the Ethiopian eunuch, and they're reading their Bible, and they're like, hey, what does this mean? It's like a gospel tea moment. Of course, you're going to hit it right off the tee, but that's not life, is it? Usually it's us pleading in prayer for the same individuals. It's us asking God for the right moment to bring up spiritual topics. It's us asking God for the boldness to risk the relationship. Most people we encounter aren't T-ball moments. They're conversations with the apathetic, the opposing, 
and the ignorant. So we need a heart that can take rejection for the sake of the few. For the few. And aren't we glad that someone risked the relationship for us? Risked rejection so that we could hear the gospel? So let us be those who respond rightly and join in on the calling to come. We want to call all. We know that this is going to be the party of eternity. His gracious invite is so amazing. We want others to know about it. We do not want to simply show up to the party by ourselves. No, we want to enter the banquet hall with a band of believers that by God's grace we helped get there. Can you imagine showing up with a mismatched large group of people with you saying, King, you told me to invite as many as I could find. And here we are. Oh, may it be so. What a joy it will be for the King, for us, and for those who were invited through us. May the Lord give us grace to respond rightly and join the work of calling all to come to Christ and enjoy Him forever. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this hour. I thank you for this passage. I plead, Father, that you would not let our hearts grow cold in our love for you. I pray, Father, that you would work this passage deep into our heart and that we would be those who accept this gracious invitation and that we want to give our lives to inviting others this wedding feast of eternity. Oh God, give us a vision of what it would look like to show up on the last day with a group of people we've invited, saying to the king, I did as you asked, as many as I could find, from the highways and the byways, both good and bad, here we are, O oh king. We've come to worship you in the sun. Give us grace, O Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name.